Welcome back, everybody. Let's begin with a couple of verses. The oft-repeating Quran lives up to its name when it repeats the story of Iblis and Adam seven times. And you can see that the angels are told to prostrate before Adam. But why were the angels commanded to prostrate before Adam? On this channel, we've previously noted numerous parallels to the stories of Adam and Iblis in pre-Quranic sources like the life of Adam and Eve and the book of the Cave of Treasures, where the command for the angels to bow before Adam is also written. We won't examine those parallels again except to note that the life of Adam and Eve says, When God blew into you, that is Adam, the breath of life, and your countenance and likeness were made in the image of God, Michael brought you and made us, i.e. the devil and angels, worship you in the sight of God. Michael himself worshipped Adam first and called me and said, Worship the image of God, Yahweh. To clarify, when you hear image of God and God's countenance and likeness, do not think Genesis 1, 26 through 27 in this case. When we're asking why the angels were supposed to bow to Adam, we have to think something else. Let's go to Genesis 1, 3. There it is in English and Hebrew if you want it. It's very straightforward and God said, let there be light. But now let's say you're in the second temple period and you're reading the Old Testament in Greek. Here's the same verse, Genesis 1, 3. I've added the Greek on the bottom with the corresponding words for light all in red. Now, let me show you a trick. You can do a pun on the Greek word for light. Here are some examples. To be consistent, I have the word for light, phos, in red here also. In the teaching of the Gnostic alchemist Zosimus, it is said that the spiritual man's common name is phos, which is phos. Phos was actually used as a name of the heavenly man in Jewish tradition. This is shown by an early document, the Drama on Exodus, written by the playwright Ezekiel in the 2nd century BCE. In this play, Moses relates that he in a dream has seen a noble man, a phos. So do a little pun in Greek and you can translate Genesis 1-3 like this. And God said, let there be man, and there was man. So when God said, let there be light, a radiant being was created. This luminous heavenly man was portrayed as God's partner in creation. The anthropos, heavenly man, was identified further with both the kavod, that's Hebrew for glory, and the cosmic Adam and thus was perceived to be in the image of God. Later Jewish mystical traditions, in fact, explicitly call the primordial luminous man the Yotzer Bereshit, the creator in the beginning. Therefore, according to this legend, Adam was a reflection of the divine glory. Some of these tales even said he was brighter than the sun. This background of the heavenly man, the very reflection of God's glory, provides the most plausible explanation to the angels bowing before Adam in stories like we find in pre-Quranic sources and the Quran itself. So the Quran borrows in part from the life of Adam and Eve, and these traditions were constructed in part based off of esoteric exegesis of passages like Genesis 1-3, on top of which many layers of mystical speculation were stacked. If you're familiar with this channel, you shouldn't be surprised. We've seen this type of thing before in Surah 38, 34 through 35, where the Quran borrows from a story in the Talmud about Solomon and the king of the demons. We've also seen it in Surah 27, 44, where the Quran borrows from the water episode we see in ancient mystical texts. So this is no surprise. Before we finish, there's one more feature of Adam's body that is of interest in Jewish literature. When Adam was created, he filled the whole world. The dimensions of his body were gigantic, reaching from heaven to earth. The first Adam was from the earth to the firmament. Not surprisingly, we see something similar in the Hadith. Muhammad said the first group of people who enter paradise and those who follow them will look alike and will resemble their father, Adam, in stature, 60 cubits tall. Adam was all kinds of enormous, according to Muhammad as well. What a coincidence. It's remarkable that so many of these hadith that were composed around centers of Jewish and Zoroastrian learning look like borrowed Jewish and Zoroastrian material. It's clear in many cases that's all the hadith are, more borrowed material. But it does seem entirely appropriate for later Muslims to put stories from other traditions into the mouth of Muhammad in the hadith since Muhammad put stories from other traditions into the mouth of his God in the Quran. What goes around comes around, or so they say.